Thank you, of course, to Su Suzanne Todd for joining us. She is uh, one of the top producers in the industry. She, her films have brought in over two and a half billion dollars in, was it trillion or billion? It's billion. <laughs> <laughs> but that's still a lot. Yeah. 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 Things like, well, the iconic Memento, uh, the Austin Powers franchise, the Alice in Wonderland uh, <laughs> films, and then... Anything we would know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited to do this when they asked me and yes, I did drag Lisa in because she is an amazing producer, has been working on this amazing film, and I just think, you know, based on the subject matter, she's been so deep into it. I was just excited. She's my girlfriend anyway, so I was happy to have her here. <laughs> People have moved so much more into more visual presentations, you know, because it's so easy on your phone or what everybody can, like, shoot something or make something. If you put together even something short form, I find it so much easier to get, especially executives, attention with, like, even a 90-second reel. Um, when you're asking them to be interested in your project. Because the thing you can do, even in a short form of something you literally made on your computer, is you can give them the bones of the idea, but you also set the tone. You know, by showing them something that you've created, the choices of the music, the choices of the font, like those choices, if you get it to where it's something you really like, then you're basically like presenting a tiny taste of what they're gonna get. But you wanna set it up and ask the question and leave them hanging. Right. So at the end, they're like, what happened? Right. And then they'll wanna make it. Right? Two plus two. Right. Don't tell them the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody should watch that 2 plus 2 if you haven't already. That Andrew Stanford TED Talk, 2 plus 2 on storytelling. Oh. It's genius. So what he says is they don't want the answer. They want the juicy deliciousness of going with you to add it up. 2 plus 2. Yeah. They want it. Not 4. Right? I joke with people that I'm going pitching with, and I always say, I'm going to get out my tap shoes and dance <laughs> on the table. But it is a little bit like that. I mean, you'd be surprised how many writers and well-known writers and award-winning writers will get in a room with executives and just bore them to sleep. Right. I mean, the thing you have to think about is like, think about the other side of the table that usually, especially in TV, they're sitting across the table listening to pitch after pitch after pitch after pitch. And from the second you sit down, it's like their eyes are crossing and they're falling asleep, having nothing to do with you or what you're bringing in. It's just the neat, like I read some study where they said anybody after 12 minutes of listening to somebody talk, you just zone out, you can't help it, you know? So. I think, I mean, it sounds so simple, but like be entertaining. Be super entertaining. And when you're practicing your pitch or going through it, you know, like I usually do it on note cards and I like to have a lot of visuals, you know, like I said to you, just because it keeps them more interested. I mean, I'll like play a song, play a clip from something else, whatever that is, but be entertaining in a way that you think your project will be, whether it's dramatic or comedic or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And don't be afraid to go shorter than you think, because I think the mistake a lot of people think is they think, well, I've got like 100 great things, and I need to tell them all 100, because then they know I've worked everything out, and then they know it's gonna be great, yeah. but they're not taking in the whole thing. What they wanna understand is the idea of it, kind of like the tone and shape and texture of it, and then again, leave them wanting to know the rest of it, because the best thing you can get in a pitch is as soon as you're done, a bunch of spirited questions, you know, like buying questions, or that they're into it, or they were listening, or that they want more information, the worst thing you get, and it usually happens when you try to dump all 100 things on the table, right. is they got bored at some point, they drowned out, and they're like, yeah, okay, you, you hit all the buttons, but I'm not really that interested. The funny thing about Austin Powers is Mike had written it on spec. He'd been developing things forever that weren't getting made, and he was super frustrated, and he had just made that other movie, like you said. And he'd given it to his agents, and they'd given it to three really big producers, um, and none of them wanted to do it. And I was literally just friends with Mike. Like I'd met him at the Oscars and his wife was cool and we would play game night. We like to do like running charades and stuff. And he gave it to me to read just to say like, I don't understand why nobody wants to make this. Like, will you read it? Really just as his friend. And I read it and loved it. And I was like, I don't understand why people are passing on this. I think it's hysterical. So then nobody else wanted it. So the agent was like, okay, you can shop it if you want. So then we sent it to everybody in town and pretty much everybody passed. And not just like your normal pass, like, no, I don't want this. I had one guy call me who was running MGM at the time. And he was like, I need to tell you this. Like, you seem like a really nice girl. You have a good reputation. Don't make this movie because it's disgusting and it will ruin what people think about you. Which I thought was hysterical because, like, of course it was kind of, you know, like off color. But I didn't think it was, you know, it wasn't that, it wasn't that bad. So we had two places that wanted it. Warner Brothers wanted it, but they wanted to develop, as Warner Brothers does. And New Line wanted it because they had a slot, and they said, oh, if you'll make it for X amount of money, you can make the movie. So then pretty quickly, we went into making the movie. But every time we tested it, it scored horribly. 
we reshot the ending, we refilmed again. I mean, you can see all the multiple endings are on the DVD if you go back to it. And we could never get our scores up. People would laugh and laugh and laugh. And then on the cards, they would write, that's the dumbest movie I ever saw. <laughs> because it's that kind of movie. Nobody wanted to write on the card. I loved it. It was genius and give us a high score. So the guy who was running distribution at the time at New Line didn't want to release it. Said, we're just sending you to video. Forget about it. And there was a guy who wasn't in charge then, who was second in charge, Mike DeLuca. And he really believed in it and convinced them to give us this, you know, sort of smallish release. And then, yeah, it built from there because people liked it. But no, nobody thought it was going to be anything for sure. If you're looking for projects, look in your own, in your life, your family, your history. What interests you? What's passionate about? What's, what are you emotional about? Like if you're looking for material, especially docu documentaries, I can say. But I think you really have to have a sense of connection to it. Yeah. It's such a good point, yeah. Because just imagine that whatever you pick, that every day for like two to five years, that you're going to stop somebody on the street and tell them how excited you are about it, and they're going to punch you in the face. <laughs> right. And so after like year six or a year, however many it is, like you have to be in that position where you're like, nope, I have to get this story told. I have to get this story told. Just, yeah, it's such good advice. Never pick anything because you think it's going to be commercial because that's just disaster and ruination and never works out. In the case of Memento in particular, there were a lot of people in town that liked the script, but there weren't a lot of people that were excited, it sounds crazy to say this out loud, about having like such a new director work on it. I mean, of course, you know. And, and he had done one other movie before that. Um, but a lot of people read the script, as you can imagine, and didn't really understand that. We really just got lucky in that case that, um, you know, there was an executive at Newmarket and he loved the script also. And again, it was just a match. But you have to remember, like, so we made Memento at the end of a very, very long road of months. It was actually more like years of waiting around because Brad Pitt had originally said he wanted to do it. And there were people who wanted to finance it because Brad Pitt wanted to do it. And then Brad Pitt, of course, had this bigger movie and that other thing and that whatever. And, you know, we kept sort of waiting for this unicorn of Brad Pitt to come together. <laughs> and then... You know, at some point, thank goodness, our financiers, New Market, said, you know, there were a bunch of other people they were interested in making the movie. And the next person we went to was Guy. And once Guy came on board, then it started rolling. But I just want to make two points for you to keep in mind. One is, for every Memento or Austin Powers or whatever, in my files, there are thousands, not hundreds, thousands of dead projects that represent years of my life, like wrinkles on my face, like times I missed one of my kids' basketball game. You know, it's like, uh, it's so, you know, the, the percentage of stuff that you develop versus stuff you actually make is huge. So, I mean, in terms of you crossing over, I think, you know, much like I said to you, you just want to take as many swings as you can. You really want to, like, keep getting up to bat. And if you find one that you're passionate about and you really put your all into it and just every door is slammed in your face, just put it in a drawer move to another one, try again, like step up to bat, you know, because there is just sort of that idea of perseverance. I mean, I can't stress Lisa's point from earlier is so, 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 so true, which is the days when you used to like sell a project to a studio and then together you would go find a director and then you would work on it with the writer and then eventually you would hire actors. They really don't want it. They really want you to come in and say, here's the script, here's the budget that I made him do for free, here's the actors, here's the director, here's the everything, and then they'll say, oh, Okay, yes, I like that. Yeah. It's just a different world. Like 10 years ago, people used to really develop from the ground up. Yeah. And it, they do it sometimes, but it's not the norm like it was. Now they just really want you to walk in ready to go. Yeah. Which chicken and egg is very hard. And always just remember, I mean, the crazy thing about getting any of these movies put together is there's no one path. And like every movie has come together on a different, there's no Monopoly board. You know, it's not like, oh, I got to get to the corner. You know, it's, you have to think of it just like water going down a hill. Oh, trickle this way. Oh, it's a block. Oh, I'll go that way. Oh, I'll go this other way. Because every movie comes together in a slightly different fashion. So just keep finding a new path. Yay. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. And, and again, thank all of you for your hard work and your dedication. And I know both of us would just say, like, stick with it, right? That's the, the only reason, like, when you'll be in the game when everybody else is gone is because you wouldn't take no for an answer, you know? Just keep getting hit in the face. Be fine with it. <laughs>